the more radical feminists, which would be those who essentially reject the scriptures or the authority of them, they, they, they tend to come across as more honest because they just, that they, they, they would agree with me on some of these interpretations and they'll just say, yeah, this just can't be right. This is obviously sexist. And so they reject it. Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance of Men podcast. My name is Will Spencer. My guest this week is Zach Garris, and he's the author of the essential book, Masculine Christianity. Aiming to refute the complementarians, feminists, and egalitarians, he sought to prove why Christianity is a patriarchal religion, with extensive scripture proofs, source document citations, and quotes from the reformers. If you've read It's Good to Be a Man by Michael Foster, you can read Masculine Christianity to see why Michael is right. Or you can read Even Exile by Rebecca Merkel, and then read Zach's book to see why she's right, too. Or read your favorite feminist Christian author, like Rick Warren, and find out why he's wrong. In fact, maybe start there. And here's the best part. Zach started working on his book in 2017 and released it in 2020. In other words, he saw this coming. So if you're looking to understand what scripture says about the true nature of the Christian religion as being irredeemably patriarchal, as the feminists say, Zach's been waiting for you. In our conversation, Zach and I discussed what inspired masculine Christianity, feminism in the Christian church, why women shouldn't hold public office, being consistent in your beliefs, the real role of Deborah in scripture, plus a guided tour through the book and his advice on how to find a good church. If you enjoy the Renaissance of Men podcast, thank you. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Plus, leave a comment down below letting us know what you think about patriarchy. And please welcome this week's guest on the podcast, the author of Masculine Christianity, Zach Garris. Zach, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. I have been so blessed by your book, Masculine Christianity. And what's funny about it is that I had seen Amazon recommending it to me for a really long time, probably a couple of years. And, um, and I thought it was a book about how to be a better masculine Christian man, because there's just tons of those books. But I remember I saw that you were interviewed by Zach Kahn on the Hard Man podcast. And what the book turned out to be was a really powerful exploration of why Christianity is a masculine religion, which gave me the backing to talk about so many things that are important to this podcast. So I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Well, good. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of books out there, I think, on how to be a man or a Christian man. <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's not really what I wrote. I, I, yeah. My book uh, is more, you know, a theological work, uh, digging into some scripture passages. But yeah, as you mentioned, it's 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 arguing there's a masculine kind of bent to Christianity, at least in its leadership um, aspects. And so, yeah, it's, it's it's a little bit different than than some of the other books out there. Mm -hmm. So, what inspired you to write the book? Because I saw that you wrote it back in 2020, which is before a lot of people started thinking about some of these issues. Not everyone, but you know, uh, but you you were ahead of the curve in, in many ways. So back when you started thinking about the book, which I think you said was 2017 or something like that, what was it that inspired you to to begin the process? Well, I, I think part of it was over the years I'd read on uh, the subject of manhood, womanhood, masculinity, these kind of things, uh, mostly from a Christian perspective. And I think I was just frustrated by the literature. I mean, there, there's some good books, there's some good parts of books, but I, I just got tired maybe of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, seeing so much of the, so many of the books being, um, from an egalitarian perspective, right? So that's that's the majority. It, it, there's just so many of these feminist, Christian feminist books churned out every year. And um, on the other side, what's sometimes called complementarianism, or, you know, I, I kind of critique that word a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't think a lot of the responses were as firm as I Want, would have liked and even some of the what i thought were the better treatments scripturally i thought had some 
they would always have some parts I disagreed with, and, and sometimes they're pretty important parts. And so I think I was going to write some articles on the subject, and then I just decided, you know, I started reading more and digging into some texts. I was even looking at some Bible commentaries, you know, when I, I cite those things in the book. And mm-hmm. and so I, I just decided to just write a whole book. I kind of, out, one day I outlined the whole thing, and that's just where I... I my mind, you know, was, was going. And so, um, instead of, you know, a couple articles, it, it turned into, you know, entire book of, uh, introduction in 12 chapters. So. So you kind of surprised yourself with your, with, with your passion for it or your knowledge for it, because you, I mean, you banged out an outline right away. Like, did you know that you, that you had this much to say about it? Yeah. I, in some ways, yes. I think hmm. it, maybe some background there. It's a subject I've, I had given thought to for a number of years. Some of it was my own experience in the church where when I, I I grew up in a Greek Orthodox church, but eventually started going to a Protestant church in Mm. high school. And even my first experience there, that church had a, wasn't the senior pastor, but they had like a woman pastor on staff. Oh, wow. And so, and even in college, I had seen that. I had seen even in what was once called Campus Crusade for Christ had women speaking and they would call it uh, talks or messages. You know, they had ways of saying it's not a sermon, but it was. Right. And so I was exposed to this stuff for years. So I had always been digging into like first Timothy two and, and reading some of the arguments or even hearing things interacting with, you know, people who would defend these practices. And yeah, I mean, just culturally growing up, I, I just, in the news constantly exposed to feminism. And I think even frustration with the more conservative wing of Protest- Protestantism, we could say, um, just not a lot said. I, I think, you know, I can even speak in my own denomination, it's the PCA, Presbyterian Church in America. Mm-hmm. We don't allow women pastors or elders, and we're not, we're not, well, we don't allow women to be ordained as deacons, but there's some, uh, variety of practice there as far as commissioning them. Um, but I, I just didn't hear a lot taught on this subject. And so even male headship or leadership in the family, you, you're more likely to get that in some books, maybe some John Piper material. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I just didn't hear it preached on a lot. Even, you know, so a pastor gets to Ephesians 5, and, you know, I, I joke, it feels like uh, that they, you know, the command for wives to submit to husbands, they they kill it with a thousand qualifications. Yeah. And and then they don't really preach wives submit. Um, so they don't, yeah, they don't preach the submission aspect that much. They'll emphasize more husbands love your wives when obviously it's, it's, it's both, but yeah. Um, so and and then I almost never heard anybody talk about women in in civil office, you know, leadership and government. Uh, but I, but I knew having seen some of Calvin's stuff and 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 other older authors that it, you know that they were more conservative on that. And even in my own mind, I was like, "There's some disconnect here. Why why is it why is it okay? Or why is it a woman can't be a pastor, but she can turn around and be?" Um, you know, governor or something like that. So I, I just, I'm like, that's just totally inconsistent. So I was always kind of going in a more conservative direction on these things. But once I sat down and really dove into the literature and to the scripture texts, and I was dealing with the egalitarian arguments, and I, mm-hmm. I became even more convinced of everything. And and I sharpened my arguments. And that's mm-hmm. that's one reason reason I like to write. I like to digest the things I'm reading. And, um, and so, yeah, so that the book project didn't come out of nowhere. It's just that, uh, 
I realize, wow, I actually do have more to say on this topic than than just a couple articles. So I want to get into the the structure of the book and the arguments that you're refuting. But but before I do, because the thought just came up, did you have trouble finding a publisher for this material when you first wrote it? <laughs> so curious about that, considering <clears throat> that I've, I've read the book and it's like, wow, this was uh, <laughs> this might have been a lot to send to a publisher. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty familiar with uh, the Christian publishing world, okay. you know, having gone to seminary and and uh, and, and just you know, read a variety of books over the years. And I knew that this book had about a 0% chance of getting published. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I'm the, asking. The, yeah, that's, I mean, that's part of the problem here is the kind of the gatekeepers of Christian publishing. Um, maybe the only publisher out there that would have given it consideration would have been like Canon Press. Yeah. Of course, they, they're, they're controversial in their own right. And so, <laughs> Right. You know, somebody has to ask um, if that's who they they want to publish with, and you know they they actually uh, do the audiobook of uh, masculine Christianity now. So oh, okay, um, I saw that. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I mean, I like a lot of the the work that Canon puts out, but I even thought my book doesn't really fit some of their books as well. I mean, now they have. Um, case for Christian nationalism, which, which is somewhat academic and has a lot of footnotes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe they would have taken up my book. I don't know. Uh, but I, you know, I'd read some of Doug Wilson's books here and I was like, well, his are more like popular level. He doesn't use a lot of footnotes mm -hmm. and my mind's filled with footnotes. And, mm -hmm. um, so I just decided, yeah, nobody's going to publish this thing. And so I was like, uh, I'm just going to start my own publishing company. And, uh -huh. And part of that was, you know, so it's not just self-published because we have published other works. And uh, part of that is I just I, I don't like most of the Christian publishers today. I think I mean, we, this is a whole subject in itself, but you, you can go down the list like Erdman's uh, was promoting LGBTQ, you know, within the last year on, on social media and the like. It's, I'm sure some of their books are just terrible in this area. Um, you could probably say the same for Baker, Zondervan, you know, some of these big publishers mm -hmm. that they do a lot of commentaries, you know, which is kind of the unfortunate thing. So these, these publishers are like wrapped up with like, I think influential or important Bible commentary series, but then they'll go off and publish some really terrible, like feminist egalitarian books. And, you know, some of them, somewhat scholarly, some of them not, but, um, you know, Crossway's doing better work, but they're, they're not as edgy as, as like my book, uh, is. So there's no way they would have taken my book on. It was kind mm -hmm. of my thought process. So, um, but I mean, this is part of the thing is the world we live in with technology. I think, you know, if we're smart about some of these things, we can, we can go around some of the gatekeepers of old. In fact, I would say that's something that social media does right now is is some of these companies lo have lost their influence to some extent. Uh, they're at least not monopolies anymore. We can we can go around them. Mm -hmm. So you and it, it does make a difference to look at the spine of a book and to see an actual publisher imprint on it, even a little bit. Like maybe it's not a huge deal because so many people self publish through Amazon or other services like that. But right. it's definitely it's definitely a meaningful. It's, it's definitely meaningful in a certain way. So you ended up starting your own publishing company to publish your own book and others who you felt, I, by the way, I don't think the content of your book is edgy. I'm like, I've, it's just, it's well, just the, that's the Bible, right? Which well, is edgy, right, I guess. But I, I mean, that's the, that's the unfortunate thing is, yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to be like unnecessarily <laughs> offensive or something, but <laughs> right. um, it's, it's just the way it is. The Bible has some very controversial texts by today's standards, right? In a, yeah. in a feminist world, uh, 200 years ago, fine, they wouldn't have been an issue, but today they are. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, again, a lot of pastors won't even preach some of these things. Um, yeah. So just by just by getting into those texts, it's already controversial. And then by taking what I think is the correct interpretation, more traditional interpretations, mm -hmm that is i guess edgy by today's standards because you're you're calling women to <clears throat> direct their work toward the home 
<clears throat> and um and saying things like women shouldn't be civil civil officers you know governors things like that. i mean look at that's a little at, edgy maybe i mean modern modern america right? it's like half the politicians are probably female now so um maybe yeah. not that high but but a lot of them so it's 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 at least offensive to a lot of people and yeah i, I so so it might, might've been something years ago publishers would take up, but not, not the state of Christian publishing, which is, it's just, I mean, this even ties in with some of my criticism though, of complementarianism mm -hmm. where I think they've at least many of the advocates compromised some major issues and watered some things down and made it a little more palatable than mm -hmm. quoting like, say John Calvin on some of these things, right? He, you right. read him and you're like, whoa, he's not speaking the same way that uh, Wayne Grudem is. They're just not. Right. So. Right. Yeah. And I think that was the thing that was the thing that really stood out to me in reading it. Oh, a couple things. First was I, I got the sense you showed a lot of restraint in some of the, in some of the <laughs> things that you said, there was a, I, I think I read in the back that you're, you're also an attorney. And so my dad is an attorney, so I recognize uh, lawyerly restraint in language. So I recognize that. But then also, <laughs> <laughs> right? Am I right on that? Like, is was there? Yeah. Like, I probably should dial it back. I, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely things I worded a certain way because just, I mean, I, I realized it's, it's controversial, and so yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if I'm making an argument or dealing with a, a topic that's gonna i think bring a lot of blowback um yeah i try i tried to argue things so <clears throat> tightly that they they critics can't you know find loopholes i mean you know they, they might have their arguments but i don't want to give them anything unnecessarily and so so i i tried to yeah maybe maybe things i wouldn't say I mean, even here, we're, you know, I'm speaking a little more loosely probably sure. than in my book. Um, but I, I wanted them to have to actually deal with the merits of the argument and, and yeah. not have some out because I said said something maybe I shouldn't have said. And so, I mean, the feminists, they don't they don't really deal with the book, I, I think, partly because they they can't. I, yeah. I don't think they can. I mean, I read all their works. I don't think they're that good. So yeah. so I'm 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 providing refutation of their arguments. And it's it's up to them if they can respond. But I don't think they can't, and so I don't think they will. So it's it's easier to just, you know, they can go leave some one star reviews online saying I'm a sexist and, you know, whatever else. But um, that that doesn't really win an argument. So, yeah, congratulations on the name calling. You really you really nailed it, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and and that that is actually I'm glad that you used the word tight uh, the phrase tightly argued because that that's kind of the feeling that I got from it, but I didn't have words to put to it. Like when I finished, when I was working my way through the book and when, then when I finished, like this is very tight, tightly argued for every case, every point that you made. And it left me as the reader with a feeling of solidity of you having stated your case and sort of planted it there like a, like a cinder block. And I'm not just saying that, like that was really the, that was really the feeling that you had done the work to, you know, to go back to the original source documents and to look at the Grudem and Piper book, which we'll get into, and to look at Calvin and to look at the studies and, and look at all the different things and footnote it so heavily to make sure that you are reasoning thoroughly and in an uncompromising sort of way. So that was that was communicated, which is which is why I really as 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 dense as it was at times, it was nourishing in the same in the same way. So I think you accomplished. And again, I'm not just saying that because you're here. Like that was the feeling that I walked away with. Well, good. Yeah. I mean, I, I wanted it to be a meaty book, not in the yeah. sense where people can't understand it, but that, I mean, it's almost 300 pages. I, I would have mm -hmm. kept it shorter if I could have probably, but I, I thought everything in there was, you know, supporting the overall argument and the individual arguments of each chapter and section. And um, yeah, I wanted it to be something that really was rock solid, you know, defending more traditional uh, interpretation of the Bible, which I think is the true interpretation of the Bible. You can call it whatever mm -hmm. you want, patriarchy, comprehensive complementarianism, um, whatever. But um, yeah, I wanted it. I mean, that's my goal is write. Well, if you're going to write a book on a subject, 
um, you want it to be the book on the subject. Otherwise, if there's already that book, then why, why write it? <laughs> That's mm-hmm. kind of my thought. So, mm-hmm. and it was sort of, um, the way that I perceived reading it was, it was sort of a, uh, not necessarily intended this way, or maybe sort of a piece by piece refutation of some of the weak points of the, of, uh, is it recovery, recovering biblical masculinity and femininity or manhood, womanhood by Piper and Grudem is it, was it meant to be that? Yeah, recovering biblical manhood and womanhood That's um, it. is a book published by, I think Crossway originally did it. Mm. Um, I know they published it still, and I think it was 1987 or maybe it was 91. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, Something like that. But it, it's it is edited by John Piper and Wayne Grudem. You know, two of the leaders of this what what then was a new movement, complementarianism, and it, it's a collection of essays. A lot of them are, you know, good, helpful. It's a mm-hmm. big book, um, pretty yeah. dense book. I think that that book had some weaknesses, one of which is just it's a, a compilation of essays and different authors. And so those authors aren't going to agree on everything. Right. And we've kind of seen this play out, I think, in the last 30 years since since the book came out uh, was kind of some fracturing in this movement. You know, complementarianism was a response to evangelical feminism. And instead of using the term traditionalist or patriarchy, they actually did use the term traditional view some in some of the early writings, but they abandoned that eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, they they came up with this new term complementarianism, the idea that a, a man and woman complement each other, you know, particularly in marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I mean I I don't love that word because it's it's new and so nobody knows what it means unless they're familiar with it. But but partly what's happened too is I think there was some deviation from kind of traditional views. Um, some interpretation of scripture passages, some maybe of like the theology of men and women. We could mention some of those things. Mm. And, but then you realize there's this fracturing within the movement where you have guys who are, I think, very narrow in their views, what we could call. Um, Mm -hmm. They, they're, they're, you know, they, 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 they affirm the two essentials of complementarianism, which is that a, a, only men can be pastors and elders in the church, and a man is to lead in the home and in, in the marriage. Mm-hmm. But someone can affirm those things and still explain them in a very maybe watered down way. And so in some sense, maybe an unbiblical way. Um, and they might not say much about a woman's duties in the home, you know, regarding children and, and helping their husbands and the like. So some of it's like, well, what do you mean by these terms? Okay. We, we affirm them. What do you mean a woman's a helper to her husband? But many of these narrow complementarians would turn around and be perfectly fine with, you know, women, civil officers, which I think just introduces a huge, like kind of inconsistency in your views. Mm-hmm. That's very commonplace. And um, so that's at least one, one big thing, but also practically in the church, even, I mean, you still see this to this day. There's guys who will say pastors, theologians, whatever they'll say, you know, uh, uh, the pastoral office is reserved for men, but women can do some of these same functions. Like, so they'll let <laughs> women preach, that's, I mean, that's the worst thing to pr- preach on a Sunday morning service, but they might let him do other things, you know, um, teach Sunday school to men. I mean, I, I mean, that's teaching theology. I don't know how that's allowed under first Timothy two, but, you know, so I looked at that and I'm like, this is, if that's what complementarianism means, this is a useless term. Hmm. And it's a, it's a complete deviation from historic Christian interpretation and practice. And I can say that's specifically of the reformed uh, 
branch of Protestantism, which which I'm a part of. But but I mean, it would even violate other other branches, you know, Lutheran, Anglican, um, doesn't matter, really. Even even the, you know, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox don't don't hold those views, uh, the fem- more egalitarian views. So, so this narrow complementarianism is just, I think, a huge problem today. And so that, that was a big thing I was responding to in the book. It's not just egalitarianism, which openly, you know, undermines the, the biblical teaching. And they would just deny that a man is a, the head of his wife. Um, to, to just deny male rule and headship completely. So obviously I'm attacking that, but I'm also critiquing narrow complementarianism and I'm, I'm in a sense trying to urge them or, or nudge them in a um, more consistent direction. Uh, we could say more comprehensive, you know, so, so th- but th- this reveals where there were some differences amongst the complementarians. So I, I like to point to John Piper as a good example. You know, he, he's for years argued that a woman shouldn't be president and governor and these kind of things. So he's, he says this stuff openly, um, and, and I commend him for that, and, and I agree with him. Um, so I think he's more consistent, but many who have been leaders in complementarianism or just many pastors and whatnot have not followed him in these things. They're very shy about some of these subjects. And um, so, yeah, so I, I, I'm arguing for a more comprehensive and consistent view from Scripture. That was that was another thing that I took away from the book was all the very subtle lines of linguistic attack that had been woven through some of the things like the, the hair splitting with words like, oh, OK, she can't hold the title of pastor, but some of the functions as if those two as if those two things can be separate or maybe if we call it like delivering a message or, or, or something like that, it's not preaching. It, it's it's uh, I think you even said later in the book, like the feminists are nothing if not creative or something like that. <laughs> I, I appreciated that. Yeah. In, uh, they're, in, you know, they express ingenuity, I guess with they're creative. Yeah. They come up with new yeah. arguments all the, all the time. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, you think of like first Timothy two twelve. it's actually not, it doesn't say anything about the office. It's I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. So it's actually the function. So yes. the fact that we end up, you know, allowing the functions, but uh, saying, well, a woman can't be hold office. It, it really, uh, it, it does get frustrating. <laughs> yeah. And that was, and I think as, as, as you reached towards the, the end of the book and, and we'll back up and maybe we'll go through, you know, some of the key points of argumentation that you had earlier in the book, but particularly once you got to the end and you were laying out the case that if you permit women in civil government, you could conceivably have a woman being a governor over her husband, right? Who is in the pews with her, but she can't preach a sermon. Like how do those two things fit together? There's a contradiction at the heart of that. Like I'd never thought about it that way before. Yeah. She's supposed to submit to him in the home, but yeah. he's supposed to submit to her as a civil authority. I mean, it, it it's just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, the, the, the Puritans used to speak of, um, headship under the the fifth commandment. So they would they would refer to fathers. So you had spiritual fathers, which would be pastors, uh, mm-hmm. but you had polit- political fathers, which would be civil officers. And so they surely didn't uh, refer to these as mothers. This was a, a masculine, you know, office for them, and and because. I mean, it just makes sense. It flows both both church and state flow from the family, from family government. I mean, I, mean, I kind of argue that there in the book, but um, but yeah, the Puritans make this point. And so it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense to have an inconsistent uh, position there. What's what's been your the response from the women in your immediate environment to writing to you having written this book? Because I have many women listeners who will probably agree with almost everything in it. I'm very blessed in that regard, even though I know that that's not the case for a lot of men or a lot of Christian men, especially. But has once you finish the book and put it out and put the case out, do they read it like, oh, yeah, I, I agree? Or was there was there a little bit of forced feedback, let's say? 
Um, I think I've gotten mostly good feedback from, you know, women that I know. Um, I, mean, I had my wife read it before I published it. So uh, she Probably saw everything. Idea. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. But she saw everything that was argued in there. Um, I think there's probably a, some things in there that women, even otherwise conservative women, might at first disagree with. Some of it might be, well, I just never really thought about that. Right? Yeah. A lot of them haven't given uh, much attention to first wave feminism and um, maybe women's civil officers. So, so these kind of issues, they just don't get a lot of thought. So if you haven't read arguments, uh, you might just adopt kind of the modern view or practice, which is, oh, well, women voting first wave feminism, that was good. Mm. And what's the problem with women, you know, holding civil office? That's normal. It's, I mean, it's normal in the sense that it's common. It's, it's not normal historically, but uh, common today. So I think some of it's uh, hopefully persuading when women, and also men, obviously, but on yeah. these issues, and they just hadn't been exposed to some of these arguments. And so um, I think some, you know, some of this is just actually raising these issues and, and opening them for discussion, which, you know, hasn't always been allowed. I think, I mean, even complementarianism wouldn't have probably talked about some of these things as much. They've shied away from some of these issues. And so, I mean, if, if anything, even if somebody disagrees with something in the book, it, it's at least got them thinking. And, um, and if they can come up with arguments against, against some of these things, fine. But I, I haven't really heard much of that. So <laughs> mostly just name calling and one star reviews on Amazon to try and bury it. Right. Yeah. Or, or ignore the book, I think is, you know, that's yeah. also easier to do. If, if you're an egalitarian, you just, you don't, I don't know. They probably don't want to deal with the best arguments out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. And that's, that's again, why I was really excited to have this conversation because I, I the, the people who listen to this podcast, the men and women who listen to this podcast are familiar with um, not just the complementarian, but also the, the patriarchal arguments. And that's why they, they listen or the perspective at least, and they're, and they're very amenable to it. And um, they're familiar with many of the verses um, and they're familiar with many of the, of the men and the leaders who talk about it, like, Doug Wilson and Joel Webin I've had on the podcast as well. But I think it's, it's the argumentation. It's the argumentation from scripture. It's the argumentation from, uh, from greats of the faith like Calvin. And it's also, it's the argumentation for, and also the argumentation against the other perspectives and where the other perspectives are rooted, because we all kind of grew up in a more or less egalitarian world, right? Increasingly egalitarian, perhaps even whatever the opposite of patriarchal is, that's the direction we're heading. So sub egalitarian maybe. Um, and so we've all absorbed to kind of by cultural osmosis, the, 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 what culture wants us to believe about, about men and women. And, and intuitively, I think a lot of men and women, I know a lot of men and women are like, this is not working. And we've discovered in the Christian faith why it's not working because the blueprint is laid out there. But what are the arguments that, fa that uh, provided the fuel for us to get into this egalitarian position in the first place. So I had Professor Janice Fiamengo on, a former radical feminist. She was on a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about how the early days of the feminist movement is not what they said it was, right? And I've got another uh, another woman, Rachel Wilson, coming on, uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks, uh, to talk about even more of that first wave stuff. But to s But that's where it happened in the secular world. Where did it come from in the Christian world? How did these ideas leak in to this to this kind of sphere that we're on and that was the part that i thought uh, was so powerful was to actually see the argumentation that you had taken the time to read and say this is the foundation of these ideas so i guess i was wondering like as you were researching what shocked you the most to discover from the re the, the preparatory work that you were doing it was like whoa that's where that came from or was there a moment like that well i i think it is fascinating to see how Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you know, one of the first yeah. wave leaders, um, she, she would say things explicitly about the church, Yeah, you know, that, that they wanted 
female leadership in the church. And then she did her woman's Bible where, you know, she's criticizing the, the, the text of scripture. And, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's good to understand her mindset. I mean, to be fair, she was the most radical, I think of the first wave feminists. And so she, she doesn't get as much attention as Susan B. Anthony, right? Mm-hmm. I just kind of think the uh, the U.S. government did those coins years ago with uh, um, Susan B. Anthony. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. they'll name things after Susan B. Anthony, but they never name things after Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And I think <laughs> it's pretty clear why, because you go yeah. read her stuff and you're like, this lady's like a little out there. She's yeah. definitely like hateful towards Christianity. Oh and and towards traditional christian teaching regarding gender roles men and women and i don't think susan b anthony you know w- was as much that way and though they were friends and so it's easier to just talk about you know the right for women to vote you just you, people today we just kind of assume universal suffrage but that's that's not how it was back then it's so it did bring a change and the question is what why were they trying to change and part of it was they didn't believe in male headship that was Mm -hmm. that was part of the problem um for them and so i think that regardless of what we think about how we should do voting today uh, researching the history and understanding the context of first wave feminism is just really enlightening and um you know, you can see see they wanted no fault divorce and some of these other things even back then. So I think all of that is, yeah, all of that was very like you know interesting to learn. I knew some of it, but digging in more, I, I saw saw more. You know, second wave feminism. I I didn't get as much into that in the book. Um, I mean, I mentioned it some, but but obviously, I think we're more familiar with that today because it's it's yeah. the sexual revolution and a lot of those things are just very much with us still. And uh, I mean, that that, uh, that was obviously ra- radical stuff. Uh, yeah. It was very much opposed to Christian morality. You know, but you mentioned the church. I, I think, you know, the church has had, you know, there's always been some Christians involved in some of these movements, but sometimes the church just doesn't respond well or respond slowly and then, eventually new views get taken up in the church. And so I think that's kind of what happened with evangelical feminism. You know, you started to have women ordained in the 1900s, but it didn't really, I don't think it really took off until like the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And then you have complementarianism coming in and responding in the late 80s. So that kind of shows you um, you know, some of these, some of these ideas, you know, I think started outside the church, but got into the church. And then when I mean, you had to reinterpret Bible text, that's, that's part of the challenge. I think the egalitarians had, but they started coming up with all these arguments and I mean, the traditional view then has to respond to them. So there, there is a challenge there. Um, you know, when there's always new arguments, you have to do your research and and try to understand what they're arguing to argue against it. But but there's also plenty of arguments where it's just like no, the text is plain; it roots this in creation. You guys are just playing games, you know. So so mm-hmm. that that's some of the response is is just know the Bible really well. Not you don't need to just know uh, your opponent's arguments, though. Obviously, we should we should try to do that. So so yeah, these things just kind of crept into the church and. Obviously, to this day, you know, the church is just very much influenced by culture. Um, some of that's impossible, but it's just it's just the way it is. But that's that's where you know teaching and preaching comes in, and discipleship. We have to be we have to be different than than the world. I liked how you how you drew the distinctions between like um, equal in equal in value, different in different in essence, complementary in roles. Like it's kind of 
all of these things put together, but to land in a single term to capture all of it at all the different levels that men and women interact. I think that's part of the that's part of the challenge is we want to extend this notion that we're all equal in the sight of God and God's eyes equally made in his image, that somehow that applies to everything or that somehow that we're complementary in, in the home and the ways that our roles function together, that that also implies, you know, that also implies complementary in all these other ways as well. When the picture from, I guess, all the different levels of, of reality, like from, from here sitting in the chair to, you know, the, the cosmic, you know, divine view, that these are all very different and interlocking. And it's not so simple as just saying, well, let's just be what culture says we are. Yeah. And, and so the complementarians would say, you know, they, they were always saying men and women are uh, equal, but different in function. And mm -hmm. so I actually, I push back a little bit on that. And that I would say, well, we have to explain what we mean that women are and men are equal because different function flows from differences in men and women. And so I, I think this was maybe an area where complementarianism was a little muddy. And I tried to do my best to clarify it in the book, which is essentially to say men and women are equal in worth or value before God. They're equally made in God's image but that actually a man and a woman are different in other ways. They're unequal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like obvious, but it's something we need to be able to say. We need yeah. to be able to say in, in one sense, men and women are not equal. And mm -hmm. um, that would help the culture in a lot of ways because they, they go, their egalitarianism flows from this equality principle. And so they affirm equality of men and women and what they mean is sameness. And so yeah. that's where you start to see interchangeable roles and then transgenderism um, because it's just really androgyny. And so basically I argue if we're going to assign different duties or tasks or roles, whatever you want to call them, men and women, that those are rooted in the created differences between men and women. Mm -hmm. biologically and whatnot. And so um, it's not just coincidence that God makes the man the head in the home, but also makes him bigger than the wife, generally. Mm -hmm. Stronger, deeper voice, mm -hmm. testosterone. How about that? It's just, it does a lot of different things. And that's those things are all tied together. And so, so part of what I argue in the book is we, sh we should not leave out the natural law arguments looking to nature and obviously creation too in scripture, but these things all go hand in hand. And we, we just need more of this today because our culture denies the obvious. They deny nature and they're not just denying scripture. They're denying like what's right in front of their faces, which is, really bad because um i mean it just means you're going down a really dark hole which is is unfortunately what what we're seeing when it comes to feminism and transgenderism and these other things and um so yeah so i think we need to recover more of the basically the christian tradition here which we have older writers on these things you can go you can go read some of these guys uh, i have some of them in there obviously calvin Mm -hmm. He's free online. You can go read his commentaries on these passages. Um, William Googe is another guy. Um, he wrote a book called Of Domestical Duties. And 1622, I think, he's a Puritan, Westminster Assembly Divine. You can find that online for free. It's uh, domestical. It's got two L's at the end. Um, mm -hmm. It's in a little older English. You can get, uh, there's an updated edition that uh, Reformation Heritage books did in a um, three-volume set. I think it's Building a Godly Home, I think is the name. I think I recommend it in the back of the book. Mm -hmm. um, William Perkins has a good book there, too. Um, probably find that one online, too. Um, Christian Economy, sometimes spelled with a O-E. Oika mm -hmm. from uh, Latin or Greek. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, so, so, so you can go read those older books. I think that stuff's great. And, um, they make these arguments biblical and appeal to nature. And, uh, I just think we need more of that. Let's recover the, the traditional Christian views. This isn't just, you know, stuff I made up. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Right. There's, there's, there's nothing that I take that I, that I take from the book that I felt like, oh, you know, it's just Zach Garris making this up. Like, it's very clear that you're working through the arguments of, uh, of the egalitarians, of the complementarians as they present themselves and, um, and the supporting material and you refute it with supporting material. And there's actually, there's very little editorializing. Right. Like, I, I think at the end, you have you have some some prescriptions, which which you support. And I appreciated that. And I appreciated like we wade through or work through all of the arguments from Scripture and from and from great greats of the faith and, and let these ideas bash bash it out. And you're very thorough. And then and then you provide some prescriptions at the end, which I think is warranted. Like you have to earn you have to earn that. And I, I really appreciated that because, again, like I said, I thought there are so many books about how to be a good Christian man today and praise God for that. I think that's a wonderful, I think that's a wonderful thing, but the, the scriptural support of the, the theological cultural foundations is what's, is what's been missing. And, and so I think the book provides the foundation that so many other books coming out today could rest on of like, okay, we have a sense of what we're trying to reestablish as men and women, but we don't individually have the time to work through all of the very sophisticated nuanced arguments that have been evolving over decades. You know, the complementarians, the egalitarians, like they've done that. They have a lot of ingenuity. As you said, they've done the work. They're very fine linguistic parsing to come up with their perspectives. It's like, we don't have the ability just as everyday members of the public to be like, hold on while I dig into Calvin on that. Like that's not, (laughs) that's not what we're supposed to be doing. So you provided, you provided that framework and sort of offered your perspective at the end, at the point when it was warranted, which I think was really important. Yeah, and that kind of fits how, probably how I think, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, I think of all these like how-to man books. And yeah, those are, those are great. It's just, I couldn't write the book like that. I, that's, that's not, uh, maybe, maybe I'm not old enough to, to, to do that too. You know, maybe when I'm older and I've got all these, experience, you know, experience and, and stories and, you know, points of, uh, steep in my mind. But the way I work is I, I analyze the, the, te- the scripture text and, and then my application flows from that. And, um, so that, that last chapter building a, a godly, as manly legacy, um, yeah, it's the application of all these things. I mean, there's, there's some application obviously throughout, but, um, you know, if you fully embrace what the Bible says about male rule in the home, the church, and society, civil government, and the like, you really embrace these principles from creation, and Paul's letters, and everything. I mean, that mm-hmm. alone is going to change your framework. That's plenty of application for today when yeah. we have so many egalitarian views that we kind of hold by. Um, just default. But uh, yeah, I do, I do try to, at the end, provide some points of application in our, especially in our culture, you know, calling, calling Christians to look different from the world. You know, it's, it's calling them to obviously seek the Lord first and foremost, mm-hmm. get in a good church, uh, read your Bible, things like that. Um, but but also practical that things we didn't used to have to say, I guess, which is like, get married, be faithful to your spouse, you know, guard against the temptations, right? There's all sorts of temptations to um, movies, TV, all, all these things that are like an attack on the home that we have to guard against, um, sexual images and, and, and the like. And so we have to, we have to be on our guard. And then, so calling people to, to guard the home. So have children, right? Have, 
have as many as you can raise well and uh, in Christ and and let's not be like the unbelievers who are, you know, either not having kids or not very many. I mean, they have a very negative view generally of, of children. And so we need to be different. The Bible has a very positive view of kids and you just got to go in understanding they take a lot of work and, but you, you should put in the work and the money and the effort, all that's worth it, right? You're, you're investing in the future. And uh, yeah, so part of that's Christian education, you know, raising your kids in the faith. Um, I think today I always counsel people. There's any way possible to, to give them a, a Christian education, uh, homeschool, Christian school, whatever it, it may be, because they're getting such secular forces in the public schools and the like. And, and so there's, there's serious challenges there. And so, yeah, I mean, you do all these things. These are kind of simple things in one sense, but um, they're radically different from the ways of the unbelieving world. And, um, but if you're firmly rooted in scriptures, teaching on all these things, male headship, the family, children, then things will look, look differently. Uh, obviously the, the other big thing is, is trying to, I, I promote uh, women focusing on the home, children. And, uh, you know, I, I argue in the book that the Bible doesn't prohibit women from working outside the home. It doesn't prohibit them from making money. Obviously you have like the Proverbs 31 woman, yeah. but it does direct them homeward. And you have a couple passages. Here's, here's some other passages that don't really get preached much is like Titus two. The older women are, are to train the younger women to love their husbands one of the things it says in there is working at home. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, it, that, that's not given to men. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not saying they can't help at home, but that's, that's specifically given to women. And then first Timothy five 14, I believe um, Paul says for younger widows, I would have them marry bear, bear children and manage the home. And it's not the same word as like male headship, but like running the home children and, and the like. And, and so those, those are just things we have to recover and and change from feminism because feminism tells women, well, hey, go do all the same stuff as the men. And then that's part of the problem is, is feminism couldn't wouldn't even have to say don't have kids. It doesn't have to mm -hmm. say that. All it has to do is say, go have jobs just like the men. Go to school forever, get careers, and now you don't have time for kids. <laughs> right? That's part of the problem. So yeah. Of course, they're also demeaning towards uh, children and the housewife. I think that's really the big problem is they, I quoted in there, fe, you know, feminism was an attack on the housewife. They denigrate mm -hmm. the role of the housewife. They have to. Because if you say mm -hmm. the housewife is a excellent occupation and we actually esteem it above all other occupations, well, then that destroys feminism. So they, they have to argue these things. And so we, we've got to push back and say, actually, the Bible's pushing women more towards the home and children. And that's a good thing. And that's not sexist. That's just, you know, really a ridiculous charge. But it's understanding that men and women are different and their bodies are different. And women have babies and nurse them. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. So it's a beautiful thing. Actually, I saw someone on Twitter who called herself a women's health expert. There was some, there was some book that she was promoting. I don't know that she wrote it. Or she was promoting someone else who wrote it. And then the guy who wrote guns, germs, and steel, Jared diamond had written a, a cover blurb for it. And she was talking about what a big deal it is that Jared diamond had wrote and had written the cover blurb for this book that said something like the rise of women, you know, women were always the ones that was kind of the title. I probably can find it on my phone. And she used the phrase, bio-essentialist misogynist. And I thought that was a really interesting linguistic evolution to actually say that biology indicates, and this is, I took this from your book, that the biology indicates the difference of essence, right? It's not that the biological, it's not that we root the difference of essence in biology, it's the other way around. Our different essence is reflected in our biology. And to say that, to assert that is misogynist. And uh, I wonder if you can just comment on, comment on that for a bit, because that was, um, that was a new linguistic weapon that I hadn't heard before. 
Yeah, I'm not sure I've heard it uh, put that way exactly. That's the first time I'd ever heard it. But I mean, yeah, it's just getting at the idea, I guess, that God made men and women differently, male and female, and that those things are expressed in our biological differences. I mean, obviously, the, the way I argue in the book is you can just look at the, the bodies of men and women, and they're obviously directed towards different things. Mm -hmm. So a man's strength would be, you know, more aimed and, and suitable for physical labor, which obviously early humans, farmers and the like, everybody's working with their hands. So that's that, that suit, suits that. And then women's bodies are suited for babies. They bear children. They um, obviously nurse them. And so those are, those are pretty clear things. And, and, um, and those get in the way of your body being able to do physical labor otherwise. So um, again, that's why I think we should just kind of use natural law, look at, look at the physical world. And I mean, those arguments would go a long way in undermining, I think, transgenderism, mm -hmm. um, that you can just change these things. You, you, you can't, I guess, you know, you can go try to, um, impersonate, you know, a woman impersonate a man to some extent by taking hormone blockers and then testosterone and the like, but, um, in another sense, she'll, she'll never be a man. And so mm -hmm. it's just introducing all sorts of, you know, problems. So. Well, there are, there are two examples that I can think of that actively disprove the entire transgender argument that simply by identifying as the opposite sex, you can somehow become that. And one was that she actually recently passed away. It was a woman who was a lesbian who, who, because she was sufficiently masculine looking with short hair, she was able to pass as a man. And so she spent many years living around men and actually wrote a book about it. And she was so shocked at the lack of emotional connection that generally exists between men. And she was so troubled to discover that her own feminist ideas about the way men relate were, were wrong. She tragically ended up taking her own life. And because she was, she was so challenged on the deepest level, what she had learned about men, that everything that she thought, thought was false and that men aren't just swimming in this ocean of privilege all the time, laughing, you know, in smoke filled rooms at how good we have it. But then there was a TikTok video that went viral um, maybe a month or two ago of a woman who had gotten transgender surgery and had taken hormones and had grown a beard and, and looked passably like a, a, a rather feminine looking man, but still with a ball cap, you know, looked, looked man enough and was crying on TikTok saying about men have no emotional bonding. I had no idea. I feel so left out and so unaccepted. And it's like, yeah, welcome to the, you, welcome, A, welcome to the world of men. And B, you can't just magically become a man in your essence and your very consciousness because you change the outside. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. I mean, that really is uh, wild that people, people think this way. I mean, I don't know. It wasn't that long ago that, you know, that what, what I never read that book, but uh, women are from Mars, men from mm -hmm. Venus or the other way around. And, and I mean, so I don't know, there's also a strand in our culture that totally understands the differences between men and women. It just runs, you know, against this kind of overwhelming movement of uh, egalitarianism. So it's just, it doesn't have to be consistent, right? Our culture is not, it's not consistent in his views. So mm -hmm. Say more about that. Well, I, it's just, I mean, we have, we still have spaces that are dominated by men or fields, right? I mean, there's, uh, you know, it's not that a woman can't be an engineer. It's that more men want to go into engineering. It's just the way mm -hmm. it is. They're kind of wired. And, and so, sometimes the feminists will complain about this and say, well, we need to push for more women in engineering why do you need to push for more women in engineering? Uh, you know, do you need to push for, you know, more men to go into, uh, I guess maybe we could say teaching, which is uh, public school teaching is dominated by women. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's men, male history teachers, like there's certain things they like to gravitate towards. Um, and, and so they kind of go against the grain. Um, egalitarianism does here. But I would also say it's just, yeah, I, there's just there there are strands here even amongst 
unbelievers because of natural law and, and the like. I mean, the culture can go as egalitarian as it wants. And there's going to be plenty of people who reject major tenets of egalitarianism. They just do. I mean, that's, uh, we could say on the right wing, culturally, politically, whatnot. There's plenty of people who don't go to church. They have no religious affiliation, but they just live in the real world. And so, and they might have some egalitarian principles they hold, but they're just inconsistent. Most people are inconsistent and they, they don't care, I guess. I, mm. More men, I think, are likely to seek intellectual consistency on these, <laughs> on these things, right? I mean, that's, that's yeah. me is yeah. I'm like, well, I, I, I need to be consistent here. I can't, I can't, uh, this just doesn't sit well. So I got to think through things and, and read and write. And, um, and so that's, I mean, I, I think that's, if we want to hold to the truth, uh, we want to be as consistent as, as possible. Um, but we should also expect inconsistency in the world. And this is also why we can mm. appeal. I mean, it's, it's why we can appeal to unbelievers on a variety of things, whether it's the truth of Christianity and the gospel and the like, we can uh, appeal to their, the, I, I mean, how about even this like practical stuff? Most people know that marriage between one man and woman for life, they all know that's the best like practice. Um, best for children. Now they don't necessarily live that way, mm. right? They might they might mm -hmm. divorce their spouse or just never marry or whatever. But everybody knows that's the most the the best the best place for children. It's the best for happy you know husband and wife. Um, but they may still be tempted to do, do otherwise, right? And so, but you can appeal to these things, and. Um, I mean, one thing we want to offer, I think, as Christians is by having godly and orderly homes that that impresses unbelievers. It's a it's a witness, a testimony to the truth of Christianity is, hey, they may not believe in the Trinity and that Jesus you know, died for your sins and he was resurrected. But they're, they're going to say, well. You know, if they if they if they've got the family right and everybody's getting this so wrong today, then maybe just maybe there's something to their other beliefs that that we should look into. And um, and so I think, you know, we want to proclaim the gospel. We tell people about Christ and his work. But we we you know, the, the I think it's first Peter speaks of adorning the gospel. Right. We have mm -hmm. we have the family life to back it up. And um that, that should provide a witness, you know, to, to people. So for the, so for the men and women listening who, um, who are discovering and living out these principles in their lives. I, again, I have a lot of listeners that are, I, I, as I consider myself a refugee from secularism, right. Just kind of stumbling in, looking for triage, you know, <laughs> all these different, like, okay, this is not working out there in the world. And I know what I, I know what uh, what feels more correct. I know what the, the picture of the teachings paint, but I've never actually dug into the argumentation for it. And that's what your book provides. So I wonder if you could walk us through, walk the listeners through the structure of the book, the chapters, and the different angles that you take on, and, and the different topics that you tackle as you move through, let's say, the table of contents, like the structure of the overall argument. And the particular points that you you push on through the book, so that someone who's listening have can have a sense when they go by the book, you know where they are on the map of of the argument that you're laying out. Sure, I want to pull up uh, my book real quick if I can. Mm -hmm. So I have the. I don't. I, I generally remember the table of contents, but it's sure. this will this will this will help us uh, so I don't make any mistakes here. And in the meantime, um, I'll direct everyone to go to Amazon and pick up the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can see the uh, table of contents yourself. You pull it up. Oh, man, it's not loading. Um, oh, here we it's go. Fine. Okay. So I got I got it here. I, I brought up, uh, pulled it on my screen. So the book doesn't start with, well, I mean, there's an introductory chapter, which, mm -hmm. um, 
I think just explains some of the stuff we've already talked about why I wrote the book. Uh, just there kind of being a gap in the literature. I, I mean, I think one thing I say in there is I do consider, you know, egalitarianism to be pushing teaching that is false. It's unbiblical. And therefore, you know, that's going to affect living. It affects how we live. So what, what you believe yeah. affects how you live. You have to, you have to look at both. And so the doctrine is I- I- important. Um, but I, I start the book with the problem. You know, what's, what's the problem? What's the chapter one, the rise of feminism and the erosion of masculinity. And so that's where I get into first wave feminism um, and how it's brought all this harm, right? You look at our culture, it's, it's, it's in chaos uh, in, in so many ways. I mean, I, I, people always talk about high divorce rates, but I, I think maybe the, the statistic that should always bring some shock has some shock value is 40% of American children are born outside of marriage. 40%. That's a lot. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it's that high. Um, and so if that's the case, I mean, people, what, I mean, we're getting close to like half of children Mm -hmm. are born where their parents aren't married. Uh, maybe their parents are living together, not married, but oftentimes I think the majority of these cases, these are single moms and they don't have Mm -hmm. dads, in the house and maybe, maybe their parents are divorced. And so they go back and forth. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, that's really bad. That's uh, that's very harmful for our, our society. And so I, I think feminism is definitely tied with that. And so that's why I get into, um, get into feminism. And, um, you know, basically I argue this is harming feminism harms, harms men and women and then children and everybody. So it's, it's destructive. Uh, but then the, the second chapter, I turn to um, scriptures teaching on the duties of men and women T- to some extent. It, it I get in there to First uh, Timothy 2.15 about being safe through childbearing. So it's kind of a mm. tough verse. But I, mm. I, I essentially argue that part of sanctification for Christian women is being feminine and that, that that means doing what godly women do so duties which would be uh having children and and so if you're opposed to children that's an ungodly attitude and and you know so that should that should be a huge concern uh spiritually and so i argue that and then for men i argue against effeminacy which is first corinthians 6 9 um I mean, that gets somewhat into some linguistic, you know, Greek, Greek issues and whatnot, but basically that, that the effeminate will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the old King James translation. And so Mm -hmm. it's been changed in some of the modern English, but versions, but, um, so yes, that, that chapter sexual rebellion and repentance. Then I get into a critique chapter three of complementarianism explain, okay, here's what complementarianism is. ism is it was a response to evangelical feminism but you know i i I have some issues with it i think it compromised in some areas and so uh that's where i i get into some of what we talked about earlier um then chapter four is christianity is patriarchal that's essentially a overarching biblical you know walk through the bible on you know god has just always appointed men to lead that's just the way it is old testament new testament prophets, kings, priests. I mean, you can just go down the line. And so that that kind of provides the background to where I get into more focused sections of scripture. Chapter five and six are on the creation order. It's the, it's the creation account. Um, both gender roles and then hierarchy and authority. So I actually, you know, I use the word hierarchy. It's something that complementarians don't always like. Um, Their least favorite word. Yeah, but I mean, it's that's the opposite of egalitarianism. So I think you know mm-hmm. you kind of have to use it. Uh, then, then I go through chapter seven is masculine authority starts in the home. So look at the home. So that's male headship in the home that gets into all those issues. Uh, Ephesians five being the most prominent. There's also First Corinthians, or, sorry, Colossians three and First Peter three, and then um, I guess First Corinthians eleven. Yeah. Um, chapter eight is pastors and elders must be men. First Timothy two and three. 
So, yeah, that's that's just arguing. It's getting that that really gets into the details of First Timothy two. But I also argue that First Timothy three, which says, you know, it says if a man wants to be an overseer or an elder, um, that's what it's referring to. Um, he must be this, this, and this. Man and one woman um, manages household well, etc. So I, I argue like I. It, that's clearly referring to men. And I get into the, the, this is where I, you know, these chapters, I get into all the egalitarian arguments and I, I try to, you know, refute them. Um, first Timothy two is obviously a big passage on, on all of this. And then chapter nine, uh, women should keep signing in the church. First Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. That is what I consider a parallel passage to first Timothy two. And it says, let the women be silent in the churches. And then it goes mm -hmm. on to say, for it's, it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, this is a big area where I think complementarianism has deviated from older interpretations. Uh, basically, everybody that I've found uh, from you know from of old interpreted this it, to, uh, First Corinthians fourteen this way to prohibit women from being pastors and even speaking publicly in church. So that would even include you know reading scripture or um, praying, leading prayer up front, but also, of course, preaching sermons. And the the modern complementarian view, thanks to D.A. Carson's chapter in that Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood book, he argues that Paul is only prohibiting women from evaluating prophecy. And mm. so I, I argue against that. I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty modern view. It only goes back to 1960s, is the oldest, basically, anybody says. And um, so I argue against that. And, and, and so that's important because I'm by taking the traditional view, it, it's actually strengthening the, the, uh, the argument, strengthening the traditional interpretation for Timothy two and, you know, basically the whole argument of the book. And so I think that's uh, that's important, and one of the problems complementarianism has faced is because they essentially dismissed First Corinthians fourteen as oh well, it's only narrowly, you know, saying a woman can't evaluate prophecy, which I, I think that just has all sorts of problems. Uh, mm -hmm. But but it's so narrow, it's like okay, so basically this 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 text is off the table now. Some of the egalitarians try to argue that it's a, a interpolation. First Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 was added later by a scribe. And that's like Philip Payne's argument. I try mm -hmm. to argue against that. I think that's pretty uh, silly argument there. Um, but the language is really similar to first Timothy two in, in a lot of ways. So, so anyway, so that's really like buttressing the argument. It's, it's, it's strengthening it overall because now you've got two big passages in the new Testament on women in the church. And then um, chapter 10, masculine authority in the church. I think this is where I, I, I argue from even like the idea of preaching and rule in the church, that these are masculine tasks. So this, this ties in with some of the other chapters and some Old Testament passages and the like, but that, that shepherding, the very idea of shepherding biblically is a manly task. So, and if that's the case, then women can't be pastors. They just can't. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and chapter 11 is masculine authority beyond the home and church. That's why I argue that these principles apply outside of the home, not only in the church, but also in society, particularly civil government. And so that's kind of what we got into. If a, if a man is, if a woman can't even lead her own household, how is she supposed to go lead other households civilly? Mm -hmm. and it's kind yeah. of the summary argument. And so it's kind of just this logical argument, I think. Uh, appeal to Calvin, John Knox, and some others there. And then, and then chapter 12, as we mentioned, is the um, leaving a manly legacy, which I got into, which is kind of application and, and kind of a call to action um, at the end there. So that's, that's really the flow of the book. Um, I mean, it's, it's fairly comprehensive. I, I don't, I'm sure there's some small issues I don't get into too much, but I generally have at least a footnote or something on pretty much every relevant biblical issue here. Can you talk about the Deborah example real quick? Because I hear that one a lot and that you 
you did a pretty thorough job without giving away the books. I think it's worth, I think it's worth seeing the, the dismantling job and you're just like, I'm just going to leave that here in pieces on the floor, but talk about that just a little bit. Yeah. Deborah is interesting because I mean, you read the book of judges and you're like, okay, well, everybody's a man. All the judges are men except for Deborah. <laughs> so something's a little bit odd there, but people like to appeal to Deborah today as, I mean, she, she comes up a lot, right? Like, Mm -hmm. Oh, well, of course a woman can be uh, a governor or something. You got Deborah, um, but they'll often even use her for like church leadership. Um, mm -hmm. So, so it's important to deal with her. I mean, Calvin, I quote Calvin in there where he's like, you know, saying basically look at the time of the judges, <laughs> you know, it's pretty, it's, it's this low point in Israel's history. And you're going to turn to Deborah and act like this is some great example, a woman's leading. And he, you know, Calvin's like, look, this is actually the fact that De God, God sent Deborah to lead in Israel at this time is a testament to how bad things were. It's not setting some normative example of female leadership. Um, but I give some other arguments, too, where I, I basically argue that there's some pretty strong textual differences between Deborah and, and the other judges, you know, mm -hmm. where they're, they're, they're all military leaders. She's not, she's, she, you know, she doesn't even want to go into war. She has Barack do it. Um, so it shows she's not even like a, a normal judge. And obviously she's not like Samson or some of these guys, you know, where he's smashing Philistine skulls. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, she, she's she's not a military leader like that. Um, she's not said to save or deliver Israel. Um, and so, yeah, I just. I, I mean, I get into, you know, some other details in there. I just. It, it, she's not. Uh, she's not some example of some woman. Leading and all of these things, just like the men, and she does ju just as good of a job and therefore women can you know, hold leadership possessions or should, I guess that's the argument. I mean, at most it just would show that in exceptional cases, a woman can lead certain things. It's, it's, it's certainly not some normative uh, argument. Um, you know, it's also good to show it's descriptive, not prescriptive. It's not telling us what to do. Just shows she was a judge in Israel at the time, or she was, it says she was judging Israel. Mm. Um, she was a prophetess. I mean, I, I think it's important, you know, we, we don't want to, demean Deborah in in arguing against some of these feminist appeals to her. But she was a godly woman. She was a great woman in Israel. Um, but yeah, she's not to be used as some example of egalitarianism. Was there anything that you uh that you were researching and reading in the book that surprised you? Like I know we talked about some of the feminist literature that you read you know, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, like, was there any point when you were putting to get the book together or writing it or formulating your arguments where you're like, you had an insight that really impacted you and, and your life? It was like, oh, wow. Okay. And, and things clicked into place in a new way for you. Um, I mean, honestly, like what I remember most maybe is some of these interpretations of, of scripture I mean, a couple come to mind is, is you know, First Timothy 2.15 with women bear, uh, be saved by childbearing, where, you know, I, I come down pretty firmly that that's referring to um, basically Paul is saying if, if you want to be sanctified as a woman, then, then you know, that's that's the salvation he's referring to is, is you should um, act like a woman. Um and then, but, but first Corinthians 14 was huge. I, I, I think when I, I don't remember at what point I started to take the traditional view is it's, it's kind of like the more I dug into it, I was like more convinced of the traditional view. And then I started to find, wow, like everybody took this, you know, older view that this, this is prohibiting women from public speaking in the church. And, um, I think that was just, that was somewhat new to me 
mean, I had to, that, that chapter, obviously I had, I had to read a lot of stuff for it, but, um, I think it really just strengthened my, my argument. And I, I guess I didn't realize how novel the complementarian view was. And it really, that ends up being a pretty important passage. It gets cited a lot kind of in the older literature along with first Timothy two. And I just, I wouldn't have, you know, before you dig into a passage like that, you'd probably just assume, you know, especially when there's like so little, like in the modern day arguing for the traditional view, there's some stuff out there, but, um, you know, you're going to be kind of hesitant of taking that when it's like, seems like nobody's taking that view. B.B. Warfield did, I mean, but he died in what, like 1929. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I quote him quite a bit in there. And, uh, but, I, but I think, you know, you, so, so that's the thing, like with biblical interpretation, you mean you want you want the tradition on your side who who wants to take a view of a passage and be like yeah nobody else has ever held this so you're like probably way off right <laughs> mm-hmm. so but but it actually ended up flipped for me is like no actually it's the other way around i've got all of church tradition on my side it's the it's da carson's view that is totally novel and wrong mm. and um and why did why did they take this more you know narrow view well i mean i can't read motives but it certainly arose during a time amongst egalitarianism where you know, it's super offensive to a lot of people. And so if we take this view that, oh, no, he's just Paul's just saying women can't, you know, weigh or evaluate prophecy. And we don't have to deal with this. We'll just deal with First Timothy 2. And now it's, you know, it's, it's not even as narrow. Um, but uh, yeah, so so that was that was new to me, I think. And I ended up even writing a journal article for. Um, Presbyterian with an O it's covenant <laughs> theological seminaries journal and, and they published it. And it was on first Corinthians 14. I took some of the arguments from my book, but I, I responded to this lady who had published arguing, you know, another view and, and, uh, and so they published it. So, so part of this is just getting this stuff out there. And um, I think that helps people, you know, hopefully people will be more comfortable taking a more conservative view when they realize the historical background to, to such a thing. Mm. Do you have time for just a couple more questions? I want to be sensitive sure, to yeah. your yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's great. So, um, so one of the distinctions you get into, particularly later on, but it's woven throughout the book, is um, the honest versus the dishonest. Maybe you call them feminists or honest versus dishonest, complementarians, egalitarians. Talk about that because – I think that's a that's a topic that I think people are sensitive, like questioning motives. But reading some of the things that that they say, it's like, it's are you really arguing this from this? Not you, obviously, but the 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 citations that you pull. It's like, are you serious? Like, do you really mean that? So just talk about that for a minute, because I appreciated that you drew that distinction. Yeah, I if I recall correctly, I basically say that the more radical feminists which would be those who essentially reject the scriptures or the authority of them. They, they, they tend to come across as more honest because they just, that they, they, they would agree with me on some of these interpretations and they'll just say, yeah, this just can't be right. This is obviously sexist. And so they reject it. So they, you know, some of them, some of them will just say, Paul's a, you know, he was a chauvinist and we just, I mean, some of them might still be Christians and they'll just say, well, Paul's a chauvinist, but he's a product of his culture. And so we just reject this part of the Bible. Um, And I think that's a lot more honest because, you know, they're dealing with the plain, what I think is often the plain meaning of the text. I know some people say, well, nothing's that plain, but no, I mean, there's a lot of parts of the Bible that are clear. That's part of the perspicuity of scripture. It's Mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's hard parts, but a lot of the Bible's clear. I mean, God communicated to us. We translate it faithfully and you know you can you can understand a lot of it what it's calling you to do and believe um and we're not just talking about one verse here we're talking about tons of it right wives mm-hmm. submit to your husbands well um but see paul didn't really mean wives should submit to husbands right, right. He, he he meant mutual submission and that they should both submit to one another and it's just i mean 
it like totally just undermines the meaning of language. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think it's a pretty important point. God, uh, the new, new Testament, of the Bible never commands wives to submit, or sorry, husbands to submit to wives. It never uses that specific language. I mean, you can get mm -hmm. into submitting one another in Ephesians 5 21, but it never says husbands submit to your wives. You know, unless it's like first, first Corinthians seven saying a, a wife has authority over her husband's body and vice versa, but that's, that's different. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, we, we go to first P I mean, I, I'd say this in the book, I think is okay. We've got Ephesians five. But what about like Colossians three, where it just says wives submit to your husbands. That's mm -hmm. it. Husbands love your wives. doesn't have any, there's nothing about mutual submission there. First Peter three, same way. First Peter three. I really don't know how the feminists get around that one. That one's, you know, he uses pretty strong language, uh, appeals to Abra uh, Sarah calling Abraham Lord and, uh, having a gentle and quiet spirit, all these things. So, so, you know, we read these things and it's like, that's, if you're going to be honest with the Bible, it means what it says. And you can either take it or leave it. That's kind of what I'm getting at is I think we should take it. I think the Bible's the word of God. But if you don't believe it's the word of God, you know, and you or, or you reject it because it's not the word of God, that's that's different from saying, no, I believe it's the word of God, but I don't like what it says. And so I'm going to come up with some other way to understand these verses. And. You know, I, I obviously I can't read hearts, right. but it's also clear, though, even in things that a lot of the Christian feminists say that they don't like. We know they don't like patriarchy and male rule and the like, and so it's not like they want male rule and are arguing for feminism. I mean, it all goes hand in hand. Um, I mean, they could say the same about us, but I think the difference is, is we just got we have these obvious you know plain language of, of scripture and historic interpretations so i i think there is some dishonesty going on there and that a lot of these christian feminists will they, they, they tend they might come up with new arguments all the time but it seems like everything they do is casting doubt on the plain meaning of the text to the point where they may not even necessarily have one particular interpretation of first timothy 2 I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man, but they will cast so much doubt on it that they're saying, well, you can't actually know what it means. So it, it has no, it has no application today because you don't know what it means. We don't know what it means. It's <laughs> Amazing. We're agnostic, we're agnostic about it. Right. So mm -hmm. that's frustrating. Um, and I think that's, um, Um, what was, what was the word I guess I used? I said they're, uh, they're dishonest. I, I mean, mm -hmm. some of them surely are. I, I don't know if I can tell on an individual level, but, um, I, yeah, I, I don't believe that these are all good actors, right? People talk about good faith arguments. Um, I don't think these are always good faith arguments. I, th I think they're, they're motivated. They're trying to push an agenda that has nothing to do with historic, biblical Christianity. And I, I mean, we also have to recognize there's, there's false teachers in the church. I mean, the new Testament warns about false teaching all the time. Paul's always warning about false teaching. Mm -hmm. And it's not just on the Trinity. Yeah. There's false. Okay. Arianism's a heresy. Um, you know, Anybody who denies the Trinity, that's that's outside Orthodox Christianity. We consider that heresy. Well, I don't know if I want to use the word heresy. We need to get in all that. But there is false teaching regarding gender roles, right? I mean, there, there, there is. It's just bound to happen in a culture that is as feminist as ours. You would expect there to be some twisting of Scripture. And so some of these people, that's that's what they're doing. That's why I say in the introduction of the book, that feminism is false teaching and it, and it does matter because it's not just some doctrinal dispute though that alone matters, but it's a doctrinal dispute that has practical outcomes, right? How are you going to structure your home? Does the wife have to submit to the husband? Does the husband have to leave? The answer is yes. 
And if you say no, you're undermining the Bible's teaching. And I would say that's sinful and actually wicked. And so, you know, people don't want to use this strong a language about feminism, but but if they are wrong, which I firmly believe they are, then it is false teaching. There's no other way around it. And it's undermining sanctification um, for men and women. And it's going to bring trouble in marriage instead of, I mean, marriage is hard enough if you're trying to practice biblical marriage. It's two people trying to live together. And so you need biblical principles. The man has to lead, which means, you know, he protects and provides. And the wife has to submit and, and respect. I mean, they both love each other, respect each other, but those mm-hmm. are kind of things, you know, it seems that men and women struggle with these particularities. And so Paul instructs them accordingly. So yeah, all of these things have um, application. I mean, even in the church, there's all these women pastors in a lot of these churches or uh, women preaching churches and, and things like that. And I, I think that's, uh, it's certainly out of accord with scripture. And so it's sinful. And so if something's sinful, and so this gets into more other theology, but it, we can displease God, right? I mean, you could be a legitimate Christian and actually displease him with your behavior. Um, you know, the first Thessalonians, I think it is, says, don't uh, quench the spirit. We, we want to please the spirit, not quench the spirit. And so um, if that's the case, then, then, you can displease God in a variety of ways, and that would include not following Scripture's teaching on the duties of, of men and women. So this does matter, is what I would say. It matters quite a bit, actually. Mm. There's a lot of discussion about um, pushing back on this notion that, well, what I do, and this, this is the LGBTQ line, is like what I do in the privacy of my own bedroom doesn't affect anybody, right? It's none of your business. It doesn't affect Actually, no, it has pretty profound consequences. And the same way with the, the management of the home. Like if you as a husband and wife, you know, the way that you manage your household has effects outside of the walls of your house. Like you say, you can displease God. And these things matter because it affects how you show up in the world. How much are you witnessing the gospel? It affects how you vote. It affects, is your wife at work outside the home? Where's the income coming from? What kind of burden does that place or not place on the husband to have to step up and provide? Like, these things matter. And I think people are resistant to having that, that, that yoke placed onto them as like, as light and easy as the yoke is, they don't want to have that yoke placed on their shoulders. Yeah. I mean, it, especially if you hold feminist or egalitarian views, which I think is kind of the default for most yeah. Americans today, even on most Christians, then the Bible's teachings are going to call you to repentance and correcting uh, correction. They're going to seek to yeah. correct you. But I mean, of course that happens on everything. That's why we read scripture. We go to church, we hear sermons. We want to be sanctified and made more like Christ. And if a church isn't preaching these things, then they're not calling you to repentance. If you're not, reading your Bible faithfully, then you're not going to hear these things. If you try to reinterpret the texts, um, then, you know, by reading egalitarian works, then yeah, you can try to find your way around them. Um, but yeah, it, it, it does affect a lot of things. It affects other people. Um, it affects how we structure the world. It affects our children. Um, mm. yeah. So it's, it's not just a private matter. I mean, You know, I even think of First Timothy three, you know, requirement for an elder. So this should be like the the example. This is the model godly home is that the elder, the the overseer, is a man and one woman. So he's a man, first off. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he he manages household well. So that's 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 what we should be looking for for leaders outside the home. So I, I would argue this applies to civil officers, also obviously church officers, that's what it's talking about, but even civil officers. We want godly men who manage their homes well. But if we have a bunch of 
Christians who the man doesn't manage, but they, you know, they, it's some egalitarian practice by just de facto the way it is, or de jure the way they actually hold, hold their doctrine. Mm. Um, these things affect broader society because now we have fewer qualified men for for other things. Um, yeah. So, and and that I mean, it's it's bad enough in the culture it is as it is. We need the church to be faithful. I think that's that's always the the sad thing in all of this is you know the church does make it worse when it's when it's unfaithful. If the church is faithful, obviously it make things makes things a lot better. And we have enough Christians in in the United States that if every Christian, every person who goes to church actually was embracing biblical manhood and womanhood, you know, mask call whatever you want, traditional Christianity, gender roles, then the United States would be in a lot better place. I think that's that's pretty obvious. Um, I mean, it's not even just feminism. Obviously, we have tons of liberal churches holding to LGBT views as well, and um, colleges, seminaries. I mean, it's really atrocious how bad how bad it is doctrinally out there. Um, and even as I mentioned, Christian publishers, they undermine historic Christian Christianity. And, and that's, that's really what we're, we're talking about here and, and very practical stuff. And so, you know, we need to repent individually and make sure we're following what scripture teaches here. We need our churches and pastors to preach it faithfully. And we also need to call other Christians to repentance and we need to pray for them, pray for the world, the church, uh, uh, the unbelieving world, but especially the church to be, to be faithful in this area. Mm -hmm. Amen. Just one more quick question, because I know that you're, you're a pastor of a Presbyterian church yourself. I, I had a, uh, I did an ask me anything podcast about a week or so ago where I gave some advice to, um, to my listeners on how to find a church. Cause I get that question a lot. Like, well, how do I find a church? So, um, how would you recommend to listeners that they go about finding a church that embraces the ideas that, that you document in masculine Christianity that probably are, that you talk about, that you preach from the pulpit in your church? How can someone go? Because I think that that is the foundation of finding a church that's not only solid biblically, but is actually insulated against wokeness. I see this as a structure that pre prevents wokeness from creeping in, because if you can hold this line, you can hold so many others. So how would you recommend that listeners go about finding a church where they can begin, if they're already doing this work themselves, where they can find a community that can support them in it? I think that's a great point that churches that are solid on these issues concerning men and women are going to also be solid on everything else because um, they're, they're obviously rooted in, in scripture. I mean, I should say, I always like to note there are ab abusive forms of patriarchy out there. Sure, sure. You can distort, you can distort the Bible in, in the other direction. Um, that exists. It's not, it's not nearly as common as egalitarianism today. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a pastor of a Presbyterian church. Um, obviously I would not recommend that you just go to any Presbyterian church because there's the PC USA, which is extremely liberal and they're the mm. largest technically though they're rapidly declining. Yeah. Um, so the PCA is generally conservative. Um, although I would say we're not all, not everybody's holding my views or talking on these things in, <laughs> in our denomination. That's for sure. Um, mm. You know, there's other reformed denominations, the OPC Orthodox Presbyterian church. That's conservative generally um, though. Again, there's exceptions there uh, on, on these kinds of issues. So, so that's, that's what makes it hard is I can't just point to one denomination. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could, I can point to denominations that I think are generally better than others. Uh, but a lot of times you have to check out the individual church. Um, and so, you know, if you live in a certain location, I mean, I, I'm being Presbyterian. I would encourage people to go to reformed churches, but if you're, let's say a credo Baptist 
meaning you don't want to baptize your babies. Um, you're probably more inclined to, to go to, well, it was, we have those, you know, they'll, they'll go to our church. So you might not care um, mm -hmm. because we, we'll welcome Credo Baptist. But, um, but it doesn't work as easily the other way if you want your babies uh, baptized, obviously, and you go to a Baptist yeah. type church. Um, so, but, but if you are, you know, believers, Baptist, it's, it's easier, I think in one sense, because, okay, you, you can go to the reformed and Presbyterian churches, but you can also, also go to some like Calvinistic Baptist type churches, whether they're part of this Southern Baptist convention or they're independent or they're, um, I mean, there's the reformed Baptists or they're, um, you know, you mentioned you go to, I, I assume your church is independent technically. Um, I think so. Yeah. And so some, that makes it hard though. You just got to go look at the individual church and you might have to talk to the pastor um, and get his views on things. So uh, anybody who's visiting a church, I mean, it's good to go a couple times. I often hear, you know, go to a church three times before you uh, really decide on it, commit to it. Um, I mean, you might be able to go once and realize, actually, this isn't a very good church. So that's fine. <laughs> right. But, but uh, you know, you can often tell a lot by websites. You can shoot the pastor an email. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you want to say, hey, what do you think of masculine Christianity? Uh, but you could, you know, at least you, they, they might be familiar. I'm not, not going to say that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you could ask that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's, there's other maybe authors you could say, uh, you know, what – I mean, you could, it does help if they're rooted in the Reformed tradition or just Protestant, you know, the Protestant Reformation. You think of Reformers, Luther, yeah. Calvin, some of the later guys, some of the Puritans. If they like those guys, they're probably pretty conservative. That's just generally the case. And so, um, you know, if somebody likes William Perkins, you know, uh, OK, like probably pretty conservative on all of this stuff. Um, so there are some, you know kind of correlations, but, but you, you could ask them what, what's, you know, what's your, what's some of your favorite authors um, and uh, the, you know, theological authors, you can, you could ask them straight up, you know, what, what do they believe about male headship in the home? Sometimes there's sermons on these texts uh, and you could dig those up and, you know, Ephesians five, first Timothy two, Colossians three, you know, those, those will help. Those are probably the most commonly uh, book, um, uh, books that would be most commonly preached and you can go listen to their sermons online if they have them and you can see what did they say you know that'll give you a good idea you might not even have to send an email so those are all kind of things you can do to check out a church um and, and try to find one i think you're more likely to find solid churches here in bigger areas but that's not always the case you, you might have to drive a little while um mm. i mean my my church isn't in a big city where we're kind of remote. So um, it, it just, it just depends. Yeah. It's, it's hard. And, and here's maybe another word I would add is you may want to consider moving to like for a job and the like, if you're in an area where it's just not a good church. Mm -hmm. I mean, that th those places exist. I mean, maybe, maybe you're able to look into, you know, helping plant a church, but um, I do think, Job consideration, location consideration, uh, a good church should always be at the top of your list. And um, it probably isn't often enough. A lot of times people just think job and weather. <laughs> right. And then, and then uh, okay, we'll move there and we'll find a church. But, you know, that mm -hmm. you might not find a good one there. It's, it, it depends. So, I mean, okay, maybe we need more good churches out there and, you know, we can try to work towards that, but that doesn't solve your short-term challenges. So just, that's just something to think about. Do you have, uh, do you have suggestions for, for couples, married kids, otherwise, you know, let's say married with or without kids to begin encountering some of these ideas in their own lives? Because you can, it's one thing to read a book and by all means, read the books and go to churches. Yes. Do those things. And we've all marinated in these ideas to some extent, you know? So, so how do, how do people begin rooting them out of their lives in practice and begin turning the wheel 
and 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 actually also lovingly work through the doctrines of culture that we've all engaged with because i get that a lot it's like they see the truth encapsulated in your book encapsulated in your bible and yet the still they run up against they run up against their their beliefs that have been enculturated so i know i i i, I definitely i want to tackle this real quick if if you don't mind um just how 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 couples can have those conversations yeah i mean i, I think it just this may seem simple, but it, it helps if you're doing some of the basic things together as, as a couple, uh, spiritually, which would include, uh, family worship. I, I think, you know, it's good for husbands and wives to pray together and read scripture together, but, but think even of your children, you know, as a, as a family. Um, and this was an old practice of the, the Puritans and the like, and I think it's great is, um, you know, after, after supper, you could do it in the morning if you have time, but otherwise, you know, you have your family meal together and then the father uh, pulls out the Bible and uh, maybe you've got a book you're going through and you just read five, 10 verses, whatever a section is, and you can explain it, um, talk about it. I think that that's good. And so you'll just, you'll end up hitting all sorts of things, not just male, female, uh, duties and, and relationships. Um, and so that, that helps cultivate these things. Pray, you know, obviously pray, pray as well. Um, I mean, I, I, I encourage people also use, uh, catechisms. We use the, the Westminster shorter catechism. Mm -hmm. Um, you can read through as a family, maybe just do a question each, each time. And, um, you know, that gives you some theology, you know, theological application from, uh, scripture. And so I, I think all that's important because it just keeps you regularly going through the Bible and uh, you're, you know, you could just start with the new Testament. That's fine. And you're going to hit some of these passages and, and um, you know, maybe you, you reflect on them more later that night um, in a conversation with your spouse. And th that helps us. I, I just think the consistent exposure to these things is, is really it, it applies to everything. It's how we, it's how we grow as, as Christians. So that, that goes just even for your daily, you know, each morning trying to pray and, and spend some time in the word. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, um, thank you for putting those pieces together. And I really appreciate um, your generosity with your time. And, and thank you also for writing uh, masculine Christianity because it's been a blessing to my faith. And, and I hope it's a blessing to all my listeners as well. So where would you like to send people to find out more about you and what you do? Uh, so I, I have a website uh, that I post articles on. It's knowingscripture.com. Um, so that, that covers a lot of Bible topics. Um, and then um, obviously they can get my book, search for it on Amazon or otherwise on the internet. Uh, I am on Twitter. If guys want to follow me there, I post quotes or thoughts or whatever on a variety of subjects. So that's probably a good uh, um, or that's sufficient. Great. Well, thank you so much, Zach. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Will, for having me. Appreciate it.